to uh, San Francisco Data Analytics. Uh, my name is uh, Chester Chen. I'm the organizer for the meetup and the host for today. Uh, tonight, I actually wear a dual hat. And uh, on one side, I'm the organizer for the meetup. On the other side, I actually work for GoPro as well. So I'm the senior manager of the data science and engineering at the GoPro. So, uh, you know, first on behalf of, uh, you know, San Francisco Data Analytics, and welcome everybody. And also, we want to thank GoPro to sponsor this meetup and all the food and the drinks and the great place. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, so I'd like to give a, a you know, GoPro to, you know, to come, come, come from and uh, say a few words about GoPro and their organizations. Uh, who's coming? Theo or? <laughs> Hello everyone, thank you for attending uh, and coming to our offices here in San Francisco. My name is Theodore Kim. I head up uh, the DevOps Engineering Group here uh, at GoPro San Francisco. Just wanted to let you know that uh, we are actively recruiting for uh, DevOps, data science, front end, back end, and product positions. So I highly encourage you to talk to one of our recruiters uh, at the conclusion uh, of this meetup. I know that GoPro traditionally uh, isn't viewed as a software company, um, but it's a very exciting time for us. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, or next month or so, we will be releasing our new product line. And in addition, uh, along with the traditional cameras, uh, we will be launching something very, very special uh, that I can't talk about. <laughs> but it has been leaked, so I, I suggest that you use Google <laughs> and see what we're up to. But it's, uh, it's, it's very exciting stuff, um, and um, we are going to have a very large cloud uh, footprint uh, very shortly. So, uh, again, uh, I think uh, you know, it's an excellent opportunity to work for an amazing brand, uh, an amazing and then also to be uh, part of something brand new, version 1.0, that uh, will be released later this fall. Great, thank you. Thank you. So uh, tonight, I feel we're very lucky to, you know, invite somebody from Daybreaks, uh, uh to talk about the, uh, you know, Spark Bar. So, you know, Spark, you know, as everybody knows, is uh, this is a new, Technology has been, you know, take over the, the industry on the big data. So uh, Databricks is the company who created Spark. So uh, Jose is, uh, you know, currently have been working for Databricks for several years, and before that, he's a data scientist at Apple, are working on Siri, uh, and then he got a PhD from UCLA, and uh, so he has a lot of experience in the machine learning and data science. Department. So let's welcome Jose. Thank you and thanks GoPro for hosting the meetup. Um, thanks everyone for coming. <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna do an overview of Spark R, but before getting into more details, I wanna do a quick show of hands. This will help me tune the content uh, to help like basically communicate better. <clears throat> uh, so please raise your hand if you are familiar with Apache Spark. Okay, so probably about half, a little bit more. And raise your hand if not only you're familiar with it, but also you're using it uh, at your job or uh, at school. Okay, so I see probably eight or seven people. Or a few more, so maybe 12, 13. Okay, and now raise your hand if you are familiar with R. Okay, way more. Most, I would say most of, most of the people here, and I assume most of, them, most of you also use R, okay? All right, uh, so hopefully um, this would be a good introduction for those who don't know Spark, and uh, basically they can use the, the, the language they're already familiar with to use Apache Spark. Uh, so about us, um, we are uh, the company uh, founded by creators of Apache Spark. Spark, as you know, was uh, built at 
UC Berkeley. Um, AMP Labs, it was the name of the, the research group that was uh, that the, the Spark was born in. And then uh, six of those people started Databricks, and the goal was to make big data and eventually data simple. And um, what we do, we continuously um, contribute to Apache Spark. A lot of the new contributions in Apache Spark are coming from people at Databricks. At the same time, we built our product, also called Databricks, on top of Apache Spark. All right, so that was like the mandatory introduction of my employer. Uh, now let's get to <laughs> let's get to um, the, the main talk. So we so people here are already familiar with R. They're using R, and uh, I, I'm, I'm an R user as well. And um, we want to know, or basically, it would be good to know why we like R, why we use it, and why people who use it are so passionate about it. There are many good reasons. It is an open source uh, language and implementation. <clears throat> it is a very dyna dynamic language and runtime. Um, by that I mean uh, you could uh, you don't have to worry about type when you're interacting with it. Um, even within a single loop, you can change the type of your loop variable. <coughs> These things uh, may scare a lot of the software engineers in a room, but are very attractive to data scientists and statisticians. Um, the interactive environment is very critical. I mean, um, we all know how important interactivity is to statistical analysis and data science in general. Um, R has a very rich uh, ecosystem of packages. Basically, whatever you want to do, there's a package for it. You just install it very easily and start using it. And uh, from the very beginning, this is uh, particularly uh, was this was the reason I started using R. It, it, it came with a rich and powerful visualization infrastructure. As a result, there are many visualization libraries and packages in R. And uh, data visualization in R is like uh, you know, head and shoulders uh, above any other like language I have experienced with. Um, the concept of data frames are very attractive. They make data analysis and data manipulation comfortable. And finally, uh, R is the language that is being taught in many schools. So every year there are thousands of people who already know it coming into the job market. So even I know of companies that are migrating from SAS or other proprietary uh, data analysis tools to R, and one of their reasons is that they can't hire for those anymore. They, uh, any new, new grad they hire knows R and doesn't know the other ones. So they just migrate to using R uh, everywhere. Okay, so these are all the good things about R. However, um, R is not, the, it has its own problems. We all know about it. Um, the, the biggest pain, uh, pain point for me has been when I had to uh, deal with a lot of data with R. Um, <clears throat> and uh, every time I was wondering if there could be a, a, a solution in which I could do all the good things I can do in R, but a very large data set. And uh, the talk I'm giving today is basically introducing Spark R, which is uh, trying to solve that problem. So we want, with Spark R, we want to keep all uh, R's flexible syntax. We want to keep or continue using the, 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 the packages. The inter interactive environments should be kept. And uh, at, the, at the same time, we want to be able to scale. And by scale, we want to be able to scale up and scale up. So scale up uh, usually refers to being able to use a very large and beefy machine with many cores or a lot of memory. And scaling out means if your data doesn't fit on a single machine, you want to be able to uh, manipulate it on multiple computers. And finally, these days, um, uh, data, especially big data, is stored in a variety of formats. A lot of them are new, Parquet, Avro, JSON. Um, traditionally, there is not good support for these types of data sources or data formats in R. So any solution that wants to uh, address big data usage of in, within R needs to address that data ingest problem as well. And um, again, Spark R, I think, addresses all these because it keeps everything that is good about R and adds uh, the last two. Okay, so. Um, at Databricks, when I started um, 
the, the Apache Spark project supported Scala and Python. And there was a research project at AmpLab called Spark R that worked with, um, uh, basically was like basically was a separate package that could talk to Spark and run um, a Spark commands from within R. And at the same time, I started look, looking into integrating that with our product. And uh, to do that, I started like seeing, looking at use cases of other. I was, some, I was somewhat familiar with how I, I used R in my last job, but I also like asked other people how they use R, other data scientists at large companies, how they use R. And this was the, the theme that was most common. Um, these industry people usually uh, use some framework that, you know, support some language to load or ingest their data from a distributed storage. You know, usually Hadoop could be other data, data sources, could be like a, a large uh, RDBMS as well. So they read that data and cleaned it, aggregated, transformed it, basically did all the, all the data manipulation that was needed to be done. And then um, saved the result, which was usually either a sample or a subset of the data on local storage, local storage of a workstation. And usually that is a very beefy machine. They bought a special hardware for that because um, they wanted to run R on it. And then they uh, used, I mean, either uh, R uh, in command line or R Studio or some other uh, environment to load the data from local disk and analyze it or visualize it or generate plots and send it to their colleagues or whatnot. So the problem with this, uh, with this pipeline is that if uh, something goes wrong, and you notice that, oh, my sample didn't good. I didn't like transform this column. I should have converted it to a double. It's now a string or something like that. Uh, you have to go all the way back, uh, run a job, usually not many jobs, and then uh, transfer it over to, to your R workstation. In fact, um, most of data scientists' nightly jobs are running to summarize their data. Um, I think when I talk to the, 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 the people who were using R, to basically then be able to, con inject it, con to consume it in their R workstation. The other problem is that you need to, the data scientists have to write some part of their workflow in uh, language Y, say for example Java um, or Pig, to work inside that framework, and then the other part, the other half of it goes in R. So they have to like be multilingual. Um, with Spark R, that problem, the, that pipeline becomes a lot simpler. I'll tell you how, but just to, you know, definition of Spark R. It is um, a, a package that is t uh, that is right now distributed with Apache Spark. So if you want to get Spark R, you got to go to, to Spark's uh, website and download the Spark, like the latest Spark release, and there is a directory called R, in it, and in, within that all is the, and the, all of the R code for the for the Spark R package. However. Starting with the next release, there's going to be a, a CRAN package published. So you can just install it uh, you know, the way you install all other R, R packages. Uh, what it does, it exposes Spark's data frames to inside the R environment. So the, the data frames it, themselves, they uh, were introduced recently, I mean, two years ago, and they were inspired by R data frames. So Spark data frames are basically kind of modeling or copying R data frame concepts. Um, R and pandas, I uh, should admit. And then um, Spark R basically exposes them within the R environment. So you can interact with Spark's data frames for, uh, in your R terminal. And uh, Spark R also includes a bunch of convenient uh, functionality for like interacting and, and sending data between uh, your local R process and, and the JVM that is running Apache Spark. Uh, so basically, we want to combine Spark and R and get best of both worlds as much as possible. So with such a package, which is already out there and we could use, the, the workload of the typical data scientist changes because you don't need this local storage step because you can um, keep data in memory with Apache Spark. And you don't need an additional framework. In, uh, you can uh, write all your code in R and uh, you know everything is one is in one language as much as you want it to be, and uh, it works. And the iteration cycle is much faster. Uh, if you notice that your sample or your summary or your ingested data doesn't have um, 
part of the, uh, don't have a problem, it's not big enough or something, you just uh, do it again at memory speed. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go uh, through a bunch of details, but uh, I have found it, it useful to just give a very high level example program of how someone would use Spark R. This is uh, like a typical Spark R you know, script that people use. And the first step, you, you load the data. Um, and, um, okay, so this is my pointer. So you load the data, and um, here you notice I'm reading from HDFS, which is distributed uh, format, and I'm reading data in JSON. And Spark will, the read.df is basically a Spark command that will read my data and uh, convert it to a Spark data frame. And then I cache it. That tells Spark to keep it in memory. On, like, if I have a cluster of, let's say, 20 machines, it will be inside the memory of those 20 computers. Then I start interacting with my data. Here I'm subsetting them and, you know, counting, uh, group, grouping and counting. And finally, I can collect and plot it. So this is a typical Spark R uh, script. Loading distributed data, some data manipulation, and at the last step, if you're visualizing collecting it. You know, there are other variants as well, but I found this to be very typical of data scientists' use case with Spark R. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna go through the architecture of Spark R. Before that, is there any questions so far? So is it converting Spark R code to Spark in the back end? Or yes. I'll go through some of some of those Repeat details. So the question was, is Spark R converting R code to to Spark uh, functionality? Which the answer is yes. I'll, I'll go uh, through details of how it does it. Uh, basically, like right here, actually. Oh, okay. So I also wanted to ask a question about libraries in R. Can you make it run distributed? Yes. So can you make libraries in R run distributed with Apache Spark? The answer is yes. I'll have a slide about that as well. Um, is a question over there? Uh, okay, so the question is, did I have to do an extra do I have to do an extra partitioning step here or no? I don't I do not have to. So for example, um, this data, if I'm reading it from an HDFS cluster, when I tell Spark to load it, what it does is basically reads the data on each machine into the JVM of that machine. However, if that partitioning that is, the, if the, the data is stored in a way that I, it's not desirable, I can repartition it with, with Spark and move the data around if I want to, but I didn't have to do it here. Usually, uh, I don't have to. So, so the question is, do we need to have machines that have enough memory to store all of the data in memory? So that, that's a good question. If I want to cache all of my data in memory, the answer is yes. I need to uh, make sure I have enough memory, aggregate memory on all my uh, cluster machines running Spark that, will, that my data can fit in. Um, usually, for me, it has been the case. But if it's not, there are solutions. You don't have to do the... Uh, the filtering and um, the aggregation or any of this data manipulation in memory, you can perform them on disk. So one big, like, very common misconception about Spark um, is that Spark uh, does distributed in memory, and that's, only, that's the only thing it can do. That's not the case. Spark can also uh, manipulate data on disk, the same way it can do for like, other distributed platforms can do. So I could just filter and aggregate my data on disk and once it's small enough, then cache it into memory. Right, so the question... Yeah, so it's a very, uh, very good question, very common use case. The question is, we have data on desperate sources, and how can we just, you know, 
after entailing them, joining them together. I'll talk about that. Let me let me show you a little bit more, um, and uh, a lot of these questions will be answered hopefully, and then yeah, there'll be others. So this is the overview of the Spark R architecture I show everywhere. Um, first, let's talk about the Spark architecture. When you have a Spark application, you have a bunch of machines that have the Spark jars installed on them. You use one of those computers as your driver. That's going to be the, the machine that runs the Spark Master um, application, the Spark Master code in it. And that driver will be using all the other machines as its workers. <coughs> so basically inside the driver and each of the workers, there is a JVM, one or more JVM processes that run Spark application. Okay? Now with Spark R, we have an additional R process running in the driver. And there is an object within your Spark driver application. It's called the R backend, which is responsible for communication between the Spark application inside the JVM and the R uh, process. So basically, when you type your, your code in your R uh, session, it is sent over to over the local socket, over the network, basically, to the R backend. The R backend translates that to a Spark call and performs that action. So basically, all the actual work is happening inside the JVM on the workers. And uh, as you all, you, you may know, one of the strengths of Spark is that you could uh, ingest data from many sources. There's a data source API. Uh, and there's a packages website called spark-packages.org. You can go there. Um, a lot of the different, a lot of sources that are common, you can find a package, a Spark package. It's basically a jar. Um, there that helps you just easily read and load data from that source. For example, there's a the package published by um, Datastacks for Cassandra. So you can just directly load data from your Cassandra uh, cluster. For S3, it just reads it as native Hadoop files. Um, you know, there's a package for reading data from HBase. There's a package for reading data um, uh, in different formats and, and from different sources. So, um, so with Spark 2.0, there's an, another addition in the architecture, and that is we can now run R in, inside workers as well. That will help us distribute the existing R functions and uh, libraries. I'll get to that in one of the slides. So up until now, whenever I gave a talk, I used to show this slide, but from now on, this is the, this is the new architecture. It's like Spark is a very active project. It changes quite dramatically from release to release, so it's very good to keep, um, and, you know, look at the latest uh, material if you're following it. All right. Um, so that was the architecture. I, I have this kind of a taxonomy of different Spark R API. This is my categorization of API. It's not anything uh, formal. I find it useful for you know remembering them. The first group of functions, or Spark R functions, these are functions that you can call in your R session, deal with I.O., basically reading and writing data. Read DF and write DF are the most important ones. You give it um, a path, it's a URI, and uh, the name of your data source, you know, if your data source is, you know, your data is in, you know, is coming from, let's say, Cassandra, you give it the name of the Cassandra data source package. And then the other parameters that are needed for that data source. In my example, I was using JSON. It's, the, it's, it's a data source already embedded in Apache Spark, just um, the path, and then everything else will be inferred. The schema will be inferred. Um, there's create data frame and collect. I'll talk about them in a bit. There are a group of uh, functions related to caching data frames and tables. Um, there is a new category of uh, functionality, uh, which are called UDF functionality or user-defined functions. These are for parallelizing existing R functions. Um, MLLib, Spark comes with a machine learning library, and Spark R is exposing a subset of them, uh, uh, the, 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 the algorithms in R. They, this is uh, an an area of active development. With every release, more and more MLLib functionality will be exposed to, uh, to, to R. 
data frame API, basically what Spark R uh, kind of code and code tries to you know, copy from R. So basically anything you can do on R data dot frames, you can using these, the goal is to be able to do on Spark data frames. And then finally SQL, with Spark R you can run uh, uh, SQL queries on your data frame, if you're familiar with packages like SQL DF, which allows you to write SQL query on data frame. Sorry, say that again. Uh, oh, so this SQL is basically the SQL that uh, Spark supports, Spark SQL supports, and I believe it's SQL 99, but um, there might be some slight uh, you know, variation. It's very close. So let's, uh, let's go, yes, another question? Um, matrix multiplication, none that I know of. Um, so Spark does have a linear algebra uh, sub, uh, in a soft component, but I don't think it's, it is exposed in uh, Spark R yet. Sorry, I forgot to repeat your question because they're recording it. So the question is, is SQL Interactive? The answer is yes. And follow up? Yes. I'm going to be able to connect to it from a visualization. So can, can we connect to this uh, from a visualization? Yes. So actually, like we have customers at Databricks that connect to uh, Spark clusters uh, for their, and, and connect their BI tool to Spark clusters and then interact with it visually. So yeah, you can connect to it. Uh, there's a thrift server in Spark. But <clears throat> once you do that, you don't have to deal with R anymore. Just talking SQL language. All right, so I'm gonna go over some of these functions in a little bit more detail. The first one, which is the, probably the most important one, is the SQL context or session. This is, a, uh, this is a, the, 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 con the thing you need to do first before you start interacting with Spark R. Spark R exposes Spark data frames. And Spark data frames are built on top of SQL tables. Basically, the, un the underlying uh, engine that uh, manages all Spark data frame operations is Spark SQL. And it has a SQL optimizer called Catalyst. So basically, up until version 2.0, you needed a SQL context. It's an object. You had to create it, basically, uh, select a session object. And then from that point on, everything you had to do with Spark R, you had to pass that SQL context object to the function. With Spark 2.0, that thing, th th there's a new concept called session. And session object uh, kind of wraps the, the SQL context object, okay? Uh, so with 2.0, all you need to do, you can call Spark R init, and that will return to you the Spark session. And from that point on, you just use that session to, to tell Spark, uh, to basically tell Spark R to do different things. Uh, I, I will hopefully have enough time to do a quick demo and you'll see how I use the session object. Okay, next, uh, reading and writing data. Um, as I, this is our architecture diagram. And you can see, as I said, JVM is, is all the actual work and heavy lifting is being done by workers that are running JVM. So we want to read and write data into the workers, and our uh, functions are readdf and writedf. Basically, just telling, I'm just reminding you, when you call readdf and writedf, no data is actually returned to your R process. Everything is still in JVM. You're just remotely talking to it. You have a reference pointer to it. Um, then is moving data between R and JVM. As I said, there's an R process and a JVM process, and they talk to each other. You can move data between them. And uh, the, to, to move data from the JVM to your R process, you call collect. So basically collect takes a Spark R data frame and collects all of the contents of it into the driver machine on the JVM and then translates all, those, all the data to R types and sends it over the, over the local socket to the R process and you end up with a Spark local data frame, data dot frame. 
And the other, uh, the other direction, you use something called create data frame. Create data frame takes a local R data frame and sends it to the uh, to a JVM, and the JVM will distribute it across the workers, and then you end up with a Spark data frame that you could like query uh, using SQL, for example. Okay. Uh, next is caching. Um, as, uh, with Spark, you can control where your data resides in the memory hierarchy. The most common one uh, is keeping data in memory, and that's like in-memory computation that we all heard when we heard the word Spark. But in, in reality, you can uh, control you, you you can control data, you know, to be in different uh, storage layers. For example, if your cluster supports SSDs, you can use those with Tachyon. Uh, you can also control the, the type of serialization and the, num the, the number of replication and whatnot. So basically, the, the one function to remember it would, would be cache that you have in a data frame, and that basically calls persist with memory only. It tries to load all your data in memory. And one thing to uh, remind you of is most of these functions are lazy. What does it mean that they're lazy? When you call cache on data frame, you basically tell Spark, next time you have to read this data frame, um, keep it in memory. So it won't do anything until the next opportunity that you have to touch the data. All right, uh, next is uh, the data frame API. This is all the familiar functionality that we all used to from R. You know, the dollar, the, um, the double brackets, and uh, you know, subsets, and names, and dimensions, and heads, and stuff. Okay? So, these are useful. And as I said, uh, SQL, run SQL queries. So you could uh, take your data frame, register it as a, as a temporary table, and then interact with it in SQL, in using SQL language. And the result of a SQL uh, query on a temporary table is another data frame, as you can see in this example. And as you can see, I'm basically assuming I have um, uh, Spark 1.6, uh, basically prior to 2.0, therefore I'm using a SQL context object. I'm passing it to my function. All right. Um, so with SQL, uh, we can mix, as I said, uh, using temp tables. So you could uh, take your data frame, register a temp table, interact with it, get another data frame, collect it. You can mix and match as, as much as you like. Very convenient uh, for actual day-to-day -day data exploration. Um, another key feature for, uh, that comes from uh, the temp table is that you could um, do part of your analysis in one language and the other part in another language, all on the same data. You don't have to like copy data. So you can load your data in R, for example, do some you know, filtering on it, register it as a temp table, and then go open your Scala REPL and interact with your uh, temp table, basically grab that table and register it and then create a, a, a new data frame from that table. They're all pointing to the same data, either in memory or on disk, and then do the rest of your work in Scala or vice versa. This is very helpful for companies that have data engineering teams and data science teams. Data engineers usually prefer to use uh, compiled language. They, they keep their uh, workflows as jars and check them in and have uh, you know code review process and whatnot. And data science team uses uh, R notebooks and just interact with the data. And they don't have to like uh, copy data. You don't have to copy data for both teams to, to deal with. Are temp tables persistent to this? So are temp tables persistent to this? Uh, no. Temp, temp table is just a registration. You just said whatever was, the, whatever was behind this data frame, I can refer to it as this table name. Now, if that data frame is pointing to data on disk, temp table is pointing to data on disk. If that data frame is completely in memory, that temp table is pointing to in memory data. And is it specific to a session? Are temp tables specific to a session? Yes. If you want those temporary tables to become permanent tables, in other words, if you want to remember their information, you've got to use a meta store uh, and persist them. But then how are you able to access that from Scala? So basically, this R and this Scala are, are running within the same Spark application. They're sharing their Spark uh, context. OK, so uh, finally,
finally, this is the latest addition to Spark R in version 2.0. And these are user-defined function, uh, you know, ability to have UDF. This is uh, very cool, and we, we hope a lot of data scientists and you know, developers uh, will be excited by this. You can now take an existing R function that comes from any package and distribute it on a, just on a Spark data frame or on a local data frame. If you want to distribute it on a Spark data frame, uh, you use dapply. So you, the first argument to dapply is the Spark data frame. The second argument is your function. It can be as big as you want it to be. And then you give it a schema. That schema is going to be the schema of the data frame that will be returned. So if your function takes, you know, um, takes the uh, takes the data frame and returns the data frame of some specific schema, you need to specify that schema in, as a third argument. So that's the that's the distributed version. You can also have dapply collect. What it does, it takes the Spark data frame, applies a function to it, but then returns an R data dot frame. Uh, and finally, if you, you want to uh, apply a function on the list, but you want to do it in parallel, on, on, uh, like on many machines, you can uh, use spark.lapply. You give it a list and a function, and each worker will grab part of that list with that function and apply the function on that list, uh, on that uh, portion of the list. Okay, so. Uh, I can take questions and then I, I have a demo and uh, I think a lot of questions could be answered during the demo as well. Yes? So you can call the function to uh, Yes. So the question was, if you pull in a function from external libraries, do you need to install it on your uh, nodes? The answer is yes. As far as I know. So let's uh, let's do a quick demo. I think this uh, will be um, helpful answering some some of the questions. Uh, I'm going to okay. Uh, so can we zoom in? Does everyone can everyone see uh, the text here? Here, um, I'm going to, uh, so for the demo, I'm going to use the Databricks Community Edition. It's a free, uh, you know, free service you could use. Uh, if you already have an account, you can sign in. If you do not have an account, you can go to databricks.com slash CE, short for Community Edition, and uh, sign up for free. And then after you sign up, you can uh, get an account like this. Here, um, I have my own workspace. Also, some other people have shared their workspace with me. So I'm going to go to my own workspace. And this is the, 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 the landing page of, uh, of our product. I'm not going to talk uh, about this. Basically, you can create mini Spark clusters and use them. And in Community Edition, they're free. So I'm going to uh, do Spark 2.0. It's already selected and create a cluster. This will launch a cluster for me. It's obviously not a big one, um, but good enough to show uh, uh, the, the functionality. While this is launching, I'm going to show you some uh, example applications here. Uh, when you open the workspace under uh, under the examples, uh, you could uh, pick um, you know a sample data pipeline project in Python or and Scala. There's also other other sample sample applications here. Um, while I'm at it, on, uh, you can also have like a full guide on how to you know interact with Spark and how to use notebooks. And uh, this is a fairly comprehensive guide on how to ingest data and whatnot. Right. So first thing I'm going to do, I am going to take the first part of the Spark uh, R uh, application. This is uh, an application that consists of three parts, ETL and data, exploring the data and modeling it. I'm just going to grab the ETL part. This is what we call a static notebook. I'm just going to import it to my workspace. So now it's a live, uh, live notebook. I will attach it to the cluster that I just created and, uh, and just run it. Uh, 
the reason I imported and I'm running it uh, quickly, I want to get my data loaded so I can show how I'm interacting with it. This is going to load uh, the one million songs data set from the like distributed the file system and cache it in memory. Okay, so that's done. Now I'm going to create another notebook called Spark R. Uh, I'm going to choose R as my language, and it's going to connect to my existing cluster. So this is a normal R notebook, or basically your normal R, R shell. Um, here I can uh, uh, interact with my data uh, either with SQL, so just to make sure that I have a table called songs table. Now I can convert that table to, which is a temporary table, to a data frame. So I'll call songs. Uh, table to df and pass it the name songs table. Okay. So now I get songs, which is a Spark data frame. So one clarification: this used to be called data frame with capital D and capital F in uh, prior versions of Spark. Um, we changed it to Spark data frame to, to avoid confusion. I can look at the schema of my data frame. basically print uh, the schema. Uh, I can call the normal functions that I'm used to, like this uh, returns the number of rows and the number of columns in my data. Okay, so next thing I want to do, I want to perform a simple aggregation and visualization of this data. So I usually bring in this package and my favorite visualization library. And now I can uh, start interacting with my data frame a little bit easier. So I call it uh, song, or it's called, so let's uh, take a look, another look at my data. And uh, I find that there is the year and there's duration in my data. So I want to look at average of durations of songs per year. So duration by year. So using songs, I want to group by here, and I want to um, uh, average duration. So let's take a look. And this is a this is a new data frame. So you can see I have here. And I have um, and I have um, uh, the average duration of, of the songs during that year. So now I will uh, collect it because I know this is a very small data, uh, data frame. This has only one row per year that we have in our data. So I'll call it um, as you notice, I'm using autocomplete. So now. This is a normal data frame. So I can change its names. And now I, and now I can plot. So I can plot, duration by year. get my plot like this. And you can see apparently there are um, there are uh, data points with year zero. So there are a bunch of problems. First I have <laughs> data points with year zero in them. And second this plot is kind of unusable because it's too long. So I can fix both of them. Uh, right. So first I am going to take uh, change my code and here subset year greater than the zero. So that's the first step. Uh, then I just go ahead and rerun my code. Uh, next, I'm going to change plot options. And visualize it again. And 
this time it makes more sense. Okay, so that is an example of how you know you could. Uh, I didn't have to run another job or like come an hour later to get my summary. I just interactively uh, worked with it because it's all in the same language and the same environment. Did it cache in memory? It's interactive. Um, I can do more, but uh, I also want to make uh, make sure uh, I can answer the question. And we are about on time, so uh, want to keep uh, leave time for socializing after the after the talk as well. So if any more questions, I'll be happy to answer. So you're just demonstrating a slick IDE here. This is very nice, but it's different, right? It's uh, a little bit, uh, it's it's nicely interactive. Uh, you mean, how, like, if, I, if you don't, if you don't want to use this ID, how, how you could do this? Or big thing, well, okay, so let me uh, make sure, you don't have to uh, use this, um, you could, uh, you know, basically this is an open source package, you can download it on your laptop and use it, or if you have an or existing, existing Spark deployment, you could uh, basically use that. It's already, it's already, it probably already includes Spark R in it if you have a Spark deployment. Well, it seems like your your uh, interface with your uh, web accessible uh, version of uh, Databricks is is a nice way to start, and then you can set up your own yeah installation. Yeah. So uh, so that community edition that I sh just showed you, we designed it specifically for training. Like it's free because we want uh, many people to become familiar with Spark. Um, it is like you don't get a large cluster, no, no enterprise customer actually uses it for real. It gives you a tiny cluster just to become familiar with the API. Um, and uh, online courses and a lot of other trainings just use it. There are MOOCs that use, the, use that, uh, that, uh, that version of our product. But if you want to use Apache Spark, uh, and with, without, you know, you don't want to use a database product, you could try it on your laptop. You probably have more memory on the laptop than the, than the micro cluster that you get with Community Edition on database. Or if you already have a Spark cluster at your school or your company, uh, you can deploy Spark uh, R, basically start Spark R in your cluster. That is also possible. If you want larger clusters, you can't use the database Community Edition, uh, you got to uh, you, you can uh, get the larger like, enterprise edition and launch uh, mega clusters. Obviously, that, uh, that's like a paid product. So was your question about the notebook? It started that way, but um, he's, he's went on to answer my question. So is Databricks Notebook available as a standalone notebook? Is Databricks Notebook available as now? You mean you can take it and use it on your own? Yeah, like uh, Jupyter. Uh, can you show us the uh, like the first data for like you know, the Oh, how uh, how I ingested that data? Yeah, because sure. So the, the question is, how did I get songs in? Yeah, let's take a look at it. This is the notebook that I just quickly ran. Okay, it lists data uh, on on the on the on the file system. And notice that this is intentionally, this is an example application, so it's intentionally more complicated than your usual use case because we want to show how we can do complex ETL with the data. And you notice that there's a header file, and it looks at the content of the header, it, it sees there is like name and type. Uh, they're all separated by new line. So, so it does not um, have to be like that? No, no, it doesn't have to. That's why I say this is an, uh, this is a contrived example to show how complicated your ETL can be. Um, so I use the normal R read table to read the small, the small file because you can see it's pretty small. And I get it as a data frame. And then uh, look at the first few characters of uh, one of the data files. And you see it's tab delimited. And then I will uh, you know, basically write a function that constructs a schema. This is a schema that can be passed on to a Spark RDD and convert the RDD to a data frame. This is another topic of how you get data frames in Spark uh, if you have to construct them yourself, if you don't use the read.df uh, function. Anyway, we use that. And then finally, so we use read.df here, and then we project the schema on top of our data. And then at the end, we get a, we get a data frame. So then, 
we register that data frame as a table and cache it. And then we can interact with it using SQL. Can you skip the function part um, if you have like a song on the like JSON file? Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah. Right. You can just do read DF, um, you know, it's source equals JSON, path equals the path to your data, and that will return, that will infer schema of your JSON and return you a Spark data frame. is, is uh, because SparkR is using RDBs under the hood, is it partitioning the data anyway? Yes, basically because we are, we are just using Spark's data frames and Spark's data frames are under the hood influences of RDBs, resilient distributed data. When your RDB is distributed, your data frame is distributed as a, as a result of your SparkR data frame. <coughs> They're all basically pointing to the same physical data, as physical as data can be. So the question is about uh, large matrix uh, operations using Spark R, like basically from Spark R. Um, so um, as I said, there's no API exposed in Spark R to do that. This is an open source project. So if you're working on distributed matrix operations, I encourage you to contribute to, uh, to Spark R. There is a, a, a linear library in Spark that MLlib uses for it's matrix and vector uh, operations. So you could expose that in Spark R. Spark and they all use Python um, because um, for some reason um, it is uh, it, it is more popular for among the instructors that teach it and also Python was an earlier language in Spark so it had definitely more functionality exposed in Python than than R probably a lot of the content of those MOOCs cannot be done in R yet because it's not it's not like the Spark R isn't there yet um, so. They, they do, you can actually with Python like create vectors and like uh, NumPy objects and like do like vector matrix uh, operations. Um, some work needs to be like, the, the, the equivalent of that needs to be implemented in Spark. It has to be. that if, if you could just natively work with data frames uh, and add make that basically convert a data frame to a matrix and then just interact with it. Um, uh, anyway, I encourage you to to check out the open source project and uh, <laughs> contribute to it. <laughs> That's the, the beauty of open source. Whenever something is not there, you ask people to add it. <laughs> yes? Do you have a, um, a simple example of like a Scala? Yes. So, so the question is, can we uh, a simple example of Scala. So yeah, so like on, on, on if you're already doing something like this in Scala, we could like um, copy stuff in Scala and put it into here as a function, right? Yeah. So let me show you one thing. Uh, remember, I created this data frame uh, duration by year. This is a Spark R data uh, data frame. See, it's a Spark data frame. What I'm going to do? I'm going to register it as a temp table. And 
call it uh, durations. Okay. That is a timetable. Now I'm going to create another notebook. Call Scala and choose Scala in our language. And now here I can um, access that that temp table that I just created, right? And I can convert it to a Scala data frame. And now it is a, it is a Scala data frame, right? So, um, and I can collect it. Your column and here. Okay, so this is how you can move between languages. Uh, as far as like a full data pipeline example, uh, again, I can point you to uh, here. There is an example. Very, the, the same example that is written in for R is also written for Scala. You can do the entire thing in Scala. So this is the same data ingest done in Scala. So you can check it out and run it and play around with it. So in this example, because you use the Databricks notebook, you were able to run R code and Scala code within the same notebook. But if you were to start, say, Spark R as a session separately, then you wouldn't be able to access those temp tables in Scala. You would. You would. Just all you need to do is yeah, just make, make sure your make your sure R that. application and your your Scala application both points to the same. Spark uh, context. But if you're spinning up, we are looking yeah. at So basically, the trick, the one you need to be careful is that when you start your uh, R session, you should not create a new Spark context. You should reuse existing Spark context that is already in your Scala application. Some engineering work involved. Uh, yes? I can try, but I'm not like necessarily the best person to answer all the questions for sure. Um, um, so I was just wondering, um, like, you said that we have this single TensorFlow. Um, the question is about TensorFlow and probably its relation. I'm squarely not the right person to answer that question. <laughs> My colleague Tim Hunter had a recent meetup. Uh, he talked about using TensorFlow with Spark. I believe the video should be online. Um, you can find it. There might be future meetups by him as well. It's called TensorFlow. Did you Google it? Yes. Um, the, I don't know, so I, I actually, I'm not sure where, like, who recorded the video. Um, it, it was at Salesforce. It was, at, okay, great. So if you just Google Salesforce Tensor Frame Meetup, you should find it. Great. It was, was it a Spark Meetup or was it a... So it meetup? was like a prediction I/O slash Tensor Frame <coughs> Meetup. Cool. Great. Oh, Tim Hunter. Thank you guys. Do you have more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you for We have other meetups uh, lined up. Uh, next month is uh, the talk from the uh, MLAB about the uh, Sustain project. And then we are, you know, there's a several meetups we're scheduling. So uh, just look at the meetup page and thanks for it. We'll see you next time. Thank you very much.